Welcome to the Other Discovery Show, the podcast that's not about other podcasts. It's the bonus show from the Podcast Discovery Show, and it's about all of the other things that we've discovered throughout the week. I'm Kirk. And I am Zach. And throughout this lockdown that is indefinite and has been a part of our lives for a minute, we've talked about, I've brought a lot of different times where I talked about historical hard time foods and I've talked about Mm -hmm. different ways that people have accessed better food than the ingredients they had. And when there was scarcity, you taught us how to cook on a hoe. Yeah. And that's an important life lesson. (laughs) (laughs) Um, no, but I read another and it had also been, it had also been too long since I talked about Atlas Obscura. So I felt like I needed to bring it back. Um, so they had an article that literally is about why we've seen such a resurgence of these types of these types of different articles and this types of knowledge. So I'll just read you the first part of this because it's, it's kind of interesting how they put it. People had spent months planning a murder mystery experience inside the Detroit historical museum as the Detroit historical society's education programs coordinator and community outreach coordinator They had imagined a party set at the height of prohibition in 1926 where guests in period attire would enjoy cocktails and hors d'oeuvres while learning about Detroit's wild and woolly bootlegging days. But on the day the event was meant to take place, the state of Michigan handed down a different prohibition. Due to the spread of COVID-19, large gatherings were no longer permitted. Museums and historical societies across the country face a similar situation. By closing their doors and canceling long-planned programs, they lost their primary means of engaging their communities. So as cooking at home became increasingly important, many historical societies turned to sharing historical recipes from their archives. Through these cultural institutions, though these cultural institutions don't normally focus on culinary matters, they found that food and drink offered a delicious distraction from the present. So a lot of these people that would have general kind of community engagement were then isolated just like we all were and they had no way to kind of reach out. Mm -hmm. And they also knew that like, and I mean, the first thing on here is to drink. So the first thing is called the last word. Um, three quarter ounce lime juice, three quarter ounce maraschino liqueur, three quarter ounce gin, three quarter ounce green chartreuse, add ingredients to a shaker filled with ice, shake vigorously for 30 seconds and strain. Delicious. What is green chartreuse? I thought chartreuse was a color. It is a color. And I actually so looked this up because I was like, what, what is green this? Other color? What color is chartreuse? Okay. So chartreuse is green-ish. <laughs> is it? It's like, it's oh. like a, a yellow green color. But mm. chartreuse, the liqueur, has been made by the Carthusian monks since 1737. And there was apparently a manuscript that detailed how to make this that was given to them in 1605. Good God. And it was, it's named after the monks grand chartreuse monastery located in the chartreuse mountains in France. And the liquor is produced in their distillery in the nearby town of, oh, I'm not even going to try and pronounce this French <laughs> town name. Nah, you have to. Voiron. It is composed of distilled alcohol aged with 130 herbs and flowers. And it's one of a handful of liqueurs that continue to age and improve the bottle. That's a lot of herbs. Yeah. So I'm guessing it's kind of like a, got like kind of a gin type thing going on or like almost like a vermouth or like a bitters where it's something very herbal. Yeah. Yeah. Herbal. Yeah. No, I was, I was curious about the same thing because like I'd heard about chartreuse, but I don't know, for some reason I was like, I want to, I want to know more and you did too. So it worked out. So Josh says that he would drink a few of those and then start twerking. Okay, well, we're going to ship some of those off to Josh. <laughs> yeah, no, KFC can't handle that. Can't handle that level. So that's the first thing they have on here. And I mean, it. I think we have the statistics now that during quarantine, people have been eating more. And which you would think we wouldn't, but we, we have been. I think it's it's comfort eating, boredom eating, whatever you want to call it. Like it's... I don't know. I've, I've Depression eaten well. eating. I've definitely, <laughs> I've been calling it the quarantine thickness because I feel like everybody's gotten that. Pretty much everyone I know that was ever once on keto is now going back on keto for some reason. Um, 
I, I my my brain wants to be back there, but my body says no. I can't. I, can't, I don't know. I, I have it's not been able to get back on the wagon, man. But yeah, no, the, it's basically just this really cool idea that even though these historical societies couldn't reach out in the way they normally would have, they knew that we were drinking and eating at home. And so they started going through their collection because this is one of the things that has been preserved kind of throughout history is recipes because people would try mm-hmm. and replicate these things. So there's always been this collection of recipes. So it's a cool way for people to reach out and access history and then also give something that people can do at home. And this made me think about, I do think that people are cooking more at home. We uh, we talked about on the, the podcast this week, the PDS, that a lot of people are cooking with their kids and like people are learning mm-hmm. to garden with their kids and people are spending a lot of time with their family. There's, they're growing there. I don't know if there's ever been this resurgence in growing your own food since like world war two with the victory gardens. You know, I, I would be surprised if there has been a single time where there's been this kind of resurgence. Yeah. And then video games, obviously blowing up. Dang people, sure. are, people are playing a lot of video games as a supplement to life things i don't i don't know yeah i mean that's what we're gonna be doing tonight play some video games with friends because we can't go hang out with friends it's it's sort of like social interaction in a way but yeah no it's just really cool to think about uh, yeah there's just there's parts of this that are so draining at times where it's you feel you feel that isolation and you feel that kind of like almost trapped into what you're doing but there's been cool things that have come from it as well and that was the the kind of the the track that this this article sent me on, and we'll have all of these things listed in the show notes as always. That's awesome. So I read this article this week about Hannibal Burris. Uh, he is a very good comedian. Like that's what I know him from is his stand up. Um, I for a long time, this was back in the day when I would kind of sometimes not listen to podcasts. I'd listen to audiobooks, and then. This was before Spotify. I used to listen to iHeartRadio and you could get like a listen to a channel and you could I listen to the comedy channel at times and it would just be like bits and pieces of people stand up. It was great because you'd hear like kind of snippets of all these people stand up. And he was one of my favorite ones that I would hear all the time was Hannibal Burris. Yeah. Um but he was in that movie Spider Man Homecoming. And <laughs> He kind of played this giant prank on everybody by through Twitter, uh, which is funny that people didn't catch on to it, but they really didn't. He sent an imposter to the Spider-Man Homecoming premiere. So basically, uh, he didn't go. He found someone on social media. (laughs) Uh, It says... In a series of since-deleted tweets, he wrote Wednesday afternoon that he needed a quote-unquote look-alike with solid comedic timing for an event tonight. So basically, I guess that's why they didn't catch on because he tweeted like a few, like that night. <laughs> so he needed someone immediately. Yeah, it was he also quick. asked for photos and offered a $500 reward. <laughs> so basically, he's like, hey, I'll pay you 500 bucks if you go to this premiere and act like you're me. Um, so the dude that said yes was on the red carpet. He was seen, you know, meeting people. He was taking selfies with people. He was even interviewed by some of the like press that was there. You at least know what he looks like. In this article, they keep saying that he doesn't look anything like him. The guy's wearing large shades and has that kind of like mustache thing that he has. His face fit his he doesn't look very much like him, but he has a just enough if that with the, the shades on. Eye, you might maybe think it was him. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's just a great troll, and it's so funny because he's got pictures from the red carpet, and this guy, of course, is you know like uh, an aspiring actor and stuff like that from Nashville that was living in L.A. Uh, but it, it was great. He even, like I said, he was even um, interviewed by reporters and everything. <laughs> It was great. Hannibal Burris is wild, man. He was, he you is. know, he was the one that started the whole Bill Cosby thing, right? No. Yeah, he literally had like he did this bit about like he didn't want to hear Bill Cosby's crap, and he like made this joke about him being the worst. People were like, "Wait, what?" 
And I guess some people like had heard about this. I feel like I had never heard about this until Hannibal Burris hmm. brought it up. And then the, the dominoes started and he's in jail now, but literally it was because of Hannibal Burris, like roasting him for like, don't tell me how I need to act to be like the right kind of black person. It's like, you're a garbage person. And yeah. he was right. He was right. In a, in a way that nobody could have ever possibly understood. Oh, yeah. So I found something this week that I immediately wanted. because And, I, and Kirk, I think, will really understand and appreciate how important this invention could be. I read about something called Sony's... Hold on, what's the name of it? It's called Sony's Rion Pocket is what they call it. What it is, is a tiny, it's like smaller than a cell phone air conditioner that fits in the back of your shirt. They make little special shirts that have a little pocket like right between your shoulder blades. And you put the little air conditioner in there and it connects to your phone and you can air condition yourself. And that is real weird. Yeah. No. And I just want a shirt that's air conditioned. That sounds great. I'm very curious how it works, like how well it works, what I mean. I'm curious about it too. And so I looked into it. First of all, it costs about 120 bucks, but the shirt is only 17 bucks. So that's not too bad. Uh, battery life's going to need to get better for it to be the best thing that ever happened. But then I found out where this came from. So this came from a program called First Flight. And this is something that Sony has created that is essentially an internal Kickstarter for Sony. Kickstarter inside of Sony? Yeah. So Sony set up a Kickstarter type service just for their own employees that wanted to develop new stuff, that wanted to develop mm. new products. And so mm. this is one of them. And literally they're showing like thermal things. So, and I mean, unfortunately it's in Japanese. So I had to kind of, <laughs> there was, there was some translation issues. There was some things that happened, but I got a general sense of what's happening here. And it like it's literally saying like a 13 Celsius degree difference between somebody who's wearing it, like a thermal reading of their back, somebody's wearing it, somebody's not. 13 Celsius is significant. That's not like meh. That's that's you would feel much better. Yeah, especially no, that's if, a pretty big difference. Yeah, if we were at work, you would you would definitely feel much better. But I they have, that today. I got I got a, a little overheated today. Pretty yeah. bad. So on this site. They have crazy stuff. Some of it sounds awesome. There's one thing, and okay, first of all, badly translated, but I think the names are all translated, so it's fine. Health server. It looks like... Okay, wh where, wh what site is this again? It's called firstflight.sony.com. And I mean, there's a hyphen and stuff. I could put it in chat or something. Um, but basically, health server is this thing where every day you walk up to it, it looks like a little... It almost looks like... Uh, I don't know, high tech toaster oven, just like a little console thing. And you go up to it and you put your thumbs on it and it reads your kind of like biometrics or whatever they call that. And it is a supplement dispenser. And so it puts out liquid supplement, like vitamin supplements based on what you particularly need in a liquid form. And you just put it in your food or you put it in your water. And so every day you get custom fit vitamin supplements based on how you're feeling that day. And each and inside huh. of it looks like little like printer toner cartridges that have vitamins in them. And it just like makes you a little mix and puts it out there. And that one was successfully fundraised. They have one That's called nuts. They have one called Nupathy, which looks like if I and this one was really hard to decipher because the, I, I I went to their promotional video and I turned on <laughs> captions and then I translated the captions to English, but it's auto translate. So. It's not right. Like, I'll just say that at some point they had the word enema in there and there's no way that's what they meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> just, no you don't chance. know. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure because what it is, it looks like a futuristic mood ring for dogs. So it's got like a little harness thing with a little light indicator on the back. And I think if your dog is anxious, it like turns red. And like, if your dog's happy, it's like green. And so it helps you better communicate with your dog and how they're feeling by reading. It's like biometrics. Interesting. And so basically they should have all this cool stuff. They have like, it looks like an AR 
tabletop projector. So like, yeah, you that's what have, I'm like, looking at right now. <laughs> the augmented reality the, one. Our auto mod is questioning, uh, questioning Josh's last comment. You might have to throw that in there for that. I'll allow it. I'll allow that. It is not. I'm telling you, the enema was not supposed to be on there. Um, but basically, <laughs> it's like a back harness thing. They have all kinds of weird stuff. Like one of the things they have on one of their newer ones, it looks like a, a home, uh, like mammogram. So like a yes. It's I don't know. Like they that have one keeps coming up large on on the on the top thing. It's because it just knows you. <laughs> No, dang it. The one at the bottom, it looks like a little like, it looks like a fire steel almost, but it's a baby low jack. It's like this little tag that you can put on your kids and like you can That's see like that is? On GPS. Uh, <laughs> the baby low jack. I mean, I doubt they'll use that in their marketing, but that's what it is. But no, it's just really <laughs> cool that not only is Sony doing everything Sony's doing as like a company, but they have enough people there that are doing like inventive things that they want to set up this Kickstarter. And then you get cool stuff like the, like the back, the Rion pocket, personal air the conditioner Rion pocket. So talking about really cool things, I found an article about one of my favorite authors, uh, Ernest Hemingway. And it has, it's literally just a list. It's a Time Magazine article, and it's a list of all the times that Hemingway cheated death because he had a ridiculous life. He, I mean, he is, granted, he was definitely called out for a lot of the things. He was very macho. I mean, you talk about, um, what is it, uh, toxic masculinity. I think probably he could... He would probably be in the category, uh, but the dude. I don't know. He was a writer. He was an artistic crazy guy. Stuff. He did. He was like very typical, like masculinity for sure. Uh, he was shredded by an Australian mortar shell because he was uh, in the war during World War One. Um, he was so badly wounded in a burst of shell fire that he felt life slip from his body. Like you'd pull us, like you pull a silk handkerchief out of a pocket by one corner and then returned. He emerged with 237 bits of shrapnel, an aluminum kneecap, and two Italian decorations. Oh, that's because he was like a a farewell to arms. That was yeah. the inspiration for that. I'm guessing. Yeah, because he was a he was a yeah an ambulance, ambulance driver. driver. Right? Mm-hmm. He was an ambulance driver for the Red Cross. Uh, <laughs> this one is nuts. He was shot while wrangling a shark. Uh, did the shark shoot him <laughs> no he shot himself trying to <laughs> shoot the shark <laughs> uh yes the sharks with lasers yeah the shark was like no you're not wrangling me in a 1935 dispatch for esquire on being shot again <laughs> again oh god uh hemingway doles out advice on how best to kill a large animal shoot it in the brain if it's close and the heart if it's far, or the spine if you need to stop it instantly. He was inspired to offer more, these instructions, he writes, on account of just having shot himself in the calves of both legs while attempting to gaff a shark on a fishing trip off Key West. How do you shoot through both calves? He shot through both of his calves while trying to shoot a shark. I literally don't know how the physics of that work. <sighs> this one... I'm not going to read the, the the whole section of it, but he had the idea and he actually put it into action where he was going to on his private boat that he had, you know, near Key West. He was going to hunt for German subs with his fishing boat. He had gotten like grenades in the submachine gun and he would drive his boat around. And his plan was if he saw a sub come up, he was going to attack it by himself. <laughs> that this is his quote i do want to read the quote uh, this he would attack the u-boat suddenly and unexpectedly and then run for it <laughs> that's what it's <laughs> and then run was. for it <laughs> it says hemingway never had the opportunity to put his reckless plan into action never got a um, chance and, to attack a u-boat by hand <laughs> and this is the one that zach asked uh he asked me off off mic if this was in here because it's crazy and it's four and five because he was downed in a plane he was basically in a plane crash twice 
While on an African safari in 1954, Hemingway survived two plane crashes in two days. In the first, a single-engine Cessna carrying Hemingway and his wife crashed when the pilot attempted an emergency landing to avoid hitting a flock of ibises. Forced to choose between a sand pit with six crocodiles lay basking in the sun or an elephant track through thick scrub. Uh, the pilot chose the scrub. Uh, they spent the night in the jungle surrounded by elephants. <laughs> the next day, the Hemingways boarded another small plane, which crashed and caught on fire. <laughs> Both were seriously injured, although not quite badly enough to warrant the many newspaper headlines reporting their death, because a lot of people actually thought they died on that one. But Hemingway walked out of the jungle in high spirits, <laughs> carrying a bunch of bananas and a bottle of gin, and was quoted possibly even correctly as saying, my luck, she is running very good. <laughs> <laughs> so he gets, he, he, <laughs> he crashes twice, uh, and then everyone thinks he's dead and he just is seen walking out of the jungle with a bunch of bananas and a bottle of gin. <laughs> and he says, man, I got some good luck. Yeah, there's only I, I don't really know that anybody else could pull off that, but I, I definitely get a mental image that's amazing of him doing that. So I discovered something interesting. They are running us running a study that is trying to figure out how our brains work when we're shopping. So Mm. they essentially ran people through an MRI scanner. They are trying to simulate like a 80 euros. I'm trying to think that's like over a hundred bucks, I think. Right. Or no, it's the other way. No, that's, that's right. It's, it's more than, uh, than dollars, but they essentially, one it's ninety three point two five United States dollars. Gotcha. So right about a hundred. Sweet. Um, basically, they're trying to figure out the rational versus emotional workings of the brain while this is happening, and it's led by the by university, and then also it's backed by multinational grocery and healthcare companies. So a lot of people are curious about this grocery companies because they want to more effectively mm-hmm. sell everybody else because they want to just they want to understand it. We know from previous research that the brain behaves illogically when faced with the sort of information overload that shoppers are faced with in a typical supermarket. It has shown us that nearly 20% of shoppers are likely to put special offers in their basket, even if they're more expensive than the normal product. And we know that nearly half of shoppers ignore buy one, get one free items and choose only one. Now we have a reliable and scientific way of validating this research and understanding exactly what's happening in the brain during a weekly shop. And the preliminary research, this is where it gets interesting, suggests that consumers only respond rationally and mathematically for the first 23 minutes of their shop, after which they begin to think with the emotional part of their brain, which can only Mm. guess at the value for money. (laughs) (laughs) They also indicate that after 40 minutes, the time... I've been there. I go grocery shopping, and after 20 minutes, I'm like, dang it, I don't even care. I just want to get this stuff done and go home. Yep, it's like, just put it in. It's fine. I don't care. After 40 minutes, the time taken for a typical weekly shop, the brain becomes tired and effectively shuts down, ceasing to form rational thoughts altogether. For sure. Mm -hmm. So this explains why by the end of your Ikea trip, you're going to buy something stupid. There's going to be something you didn't need. It's not. Why do we have so many freaking meatballs? (laughs) Meatballs. Now you got to get the meatballs right in the middle. You got to try and reset the thought times. No, but I just thought it was really interesting. And I also thought about this because I wanted to buy something amazing. I saw this this thing that's literally, it looks like, you know how they have those shaker things for like powder mixes where you shake them up? Protein mixes? Yeah, yeah. It looks kind of like that, but it is the opposite of that because it's not supposed to be healthy. What it is, is it looks like a shaker and it's got like, it looks more like an infuser. You know what I mean? That has like the drop down Mm -hmm. thing. You put the infuser thing in, but the drop down is filled with cereal and you fill up the outside with milk. And when you tip it back, they mix at the moment they go into your mouth. What? Yeah. And so. Milk and cereal. Yeah. Literally, you can just have this cup and every single sip is perfectly crunchy, freshly, freshly milked. That sounds terrible. (laughs) Freshly milked cereal. (laughs) But then I was like, you know what? I'm not thinking with my rational brain. That is not not your rational brain. (laughs) That sounds like something from Sky Mall. (laughs) 
<laughs> it does, but don't act like you don't like. Can you imagine if right now you had just a cup of cinnamon toast crunch sitting there that you could just take a sip out of, and you don't have to worry about eating it really fast because it'll get soggy? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. Seems amazing. Yeah, it's very specific, and I did not buy it, but I was like, I'd try it if someone sent it to me for free. I would try it out for sure. Awesome. But yeah, the uh, if you get one, bring it to work because I want to try it too. Yeah, I mean, I can get one. I'll, I'll send one to Josh too because he's curious. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's uh, that's all of our normal discoveries for the week. But I do have another band. Uh, just the Sweet. other just the other week, I talked to a local band from St. Pete called La Lucha, and they just put out a new album. They're uh, they're a fantastic jazz band and we've actually featured them on Todd's mm-hmm. before but I, I got in touch with them for Creators Cove so I wanted to bring it back especially because their new album's great but in general thanks everybody for for listening thanks everybody who's uh, joined the live stream we've been live streaming every week for a little bit now and we'd love to have you join the live stream so you could join the conversation with us tell you how how you feel about random things we've discovered tell us random things you've discovered throughout the week we have a Facebook group where you can do basically the same thing. You can let us know anything you've discovered, and we have a we have a fun time in there. But we'd love for you to get in touch, and we really appreciate you listening. Yeah, and uh, like Zach said, we're streaming and all the places. So whatever is the easiest one for you to check out, uh, YouTube, Twitch, and also in our Facebook club, the Podcast Discovery Club, we'd love to see you on any of those places. Or just listen to the podcast and then hit us up on socials. But yeah. Thanks so much for listening. And now, without any further ado, this is from their new album, Everybody Wants to Rule the World by La Lucha. This song is called The Sundering. La Lucha!
ました。